Good morning, everybody. It's 1030. We'll get started. Welcome to the 2021, December 2021 Wild Science Webinar. I appreciate everybody taking some time to join us to hear about the great work that our colleagues are doing throughout the natural state. Um, we're going to hear today from Randy Brent uh, about prescribed fire and Jimmy Barnett about uh, invasive carp. Uh, Randy will be kicking things off for us, so I'll introduce him first. Uh, Randy is the prescribed fire manager for the agency. He earned a BS degree in natural resource management from Arkansas Tech University. Got started professionally uh, during the wildfire seasons of uh, 2007 out in the western U.S., uh, working with the U.S. Forest Service, uh, conducting both prescribed fires and uh, suppression of large wildfires in 27 states. In uh, 2014, he came to work with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission and has led a prescribed fire program that has seen over 145,000 acres implemented on state-owned wildlife management areas in Arkansas. Uh, throughout his career, Randy has been directly involved in over 400,000 acres of prescribed fire implementation and more than 750,000 acres of wildfire suppression. Randy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Trey. All right, is the, uh, the slides changing there? We got you, Randy. Full screen and uh, and the slides are, are working. Awesome. So I am Randy Brantz. I'm the prescribed fire manager for the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about restoring the fire adapted ecosystem. I think a lot of times uh, when we can begin to talk about restoring these ecosystems, we have to take into account that it's not a one size fits all answer to achieve restoration within our state. Uh, that's due to our state really having six main eco regions and then those can be further divided down into smaller eco regions. They all have unique geology, climate, uh, soil, flora, fauna, and past land use practices across history that's either promoted or inhibited uh, fire spread. These unique inputs that you can see across these vast areas intertwine and work together to not only define the ecosystem as a whole, but allow us to generalize historic fire regimes. These historic regimes shaped the landscape and our vegetative communities, which in turn shaped our animal communities. Our prescribed fire efforts aim to manage these vegetative communities and where possible, return to pre-settlement conditions. With restored conditions, these sites can provide life cycle needs for abundant numbers of wildlife. So fire is an operating component of an ecosystem that requires past, present, and possible future influences understand. So that begs the question of how we determine these natural regimes. If restoration is our goal, frequency, intensity, and fuel consumption should drive our prescribed fire objectives. We have to look into clues left behind to define historical patterns and derive these patterns. We have personal accounts from travelers and evidence of fire scar and tree rings and those are easy to obtain and see as evidence of that history. We also have GLO notes from when the Louisiana Purchase was done and the United States was settled. We can also look to scientific literature based on historical climatology, uh, tree ring data, and other factors to drive these patterns. Um, they produce these maps that show uh, how fire burned across the entire U.S., but we can zoom in and look at of how it would have been in Arkansas. So generally speaking, we can derive that fire was relatively frequent and played a role on our landscape. It's accepted somewhere in the two to 10 year uh, return over on the upland systems, uh, we would have had fire on the landscape. The issue is all these processes were interrupted. In the 1800s, European settlement saw continued burning and as settlement expanded, explo exploitation of timber resources occurred, and we saw vast clear cuts. By the early 1900s, our new national forests were formed, and we were regenerating new forests. 
but there were still stubborn pyro southerners living on the forest and around the forest doing large-scale burning to combat this UFS, usfs launched some of the most successful propaganda in history to reduce fire currents and over time fires slowly decline in our culture We now know better and understand how removing fire from the ecological process affects our, our wild communities. We have to consider plant diversity from top to bottom and the effects that could and will have on our wildlife species. So without fire, we end up with this mesification across our forest, species that would have historically stayed on wetter sites, slowly moving up slopes and into our more fire dependent communities without that fire. Variability in successional stages across our landscape is key for life cycle needs to be met across our landscape. And without fire, habitats are shrunk and islands are created. With fire, those islands can disappear and species have greater use in the landscape. So we end up with larger areas of the forest or open land systems or woodlands or savannas that those species can use instead of smaller areas. But there's a process to restoring these habitats. They can start at the bottom as education for agencies and the public and progress into training, experience, cooperative learning, and other avenues. Here at Game and Fish, we make an effort to hit all these concepts to get to the application of, to the prescribed fire stage, but it's a methodical one. In the 80s, Game and Fish was burning at a limited scale in open land habitats. But as time progressed through the 90s and in the early 2000s, things changed. From the Game and Fish forming a part-time burn crew to increased partnerships, the impact has been measurable. Oak symposiums have shifted perception on burning and hardwood systems. State wildlife grants have followed and continued. And full-time position of fire was developed in our habitat program as increased large-scale restoration on areas that are fire-dependent, like Carol D. Alexander. These efforts are not one-time endeavors. It has to be a continual application coupled with other forestry practices. We have reached a point where fire in most cases cannot restore these sites alone, but continued effort and repeated burning is slowly shifting these habitats. We have now areas across the state like Carol e. Alexander, Alexander WMA that is the most diverse in the WMA system with over 800 species identified on the area. In places like Buck Ridge, Gene Rush WMA, that's ecologically diverse. So the question is always how much is enough? And on the ground side evaluations usually help us determine that answer. We now know we weren't, we were, we now know what we're doing wasn't enough and have ramped up those efforts yearly to apply more prescribed fire on the ground, not only on our lands, but our partners as well. So that top graph is um, how many acres by the fiscal year the game of fish has burned since FY14 through FY21. And then that bottom one is the cooperative efforts. Um, and that's assisting other agencies, National Park Service, U.S. Forest Service, Quail Forever, um, the Forestry Division, all those different agencies we try to get on the ground and help as well. And then we talk about seasonality and when we burn. There's an issue with uh, historically, most of the burning in the state took, took part in that March time frame. And if you look at the percent of acres that Game Fish has completed, that's still up there. It's still over 52, over 15% of our acres have been completed in that month. But if you look back at past, um, fiscal years, that number was up there around 70%. So we're shifting a lot of our burning into that July, August, September, October timeframe and really thinking about prescribed fire year round. You can see those times of the year, May through July, uh, when the humidity is higher, we have ground nesting species, we don't really burn that much. It's very small targeted areas. But other than that, we try to open, open up the year. We have to consider our frequency in ignition, we're looking at when to burn across these months, our pattern in ignition, what that will have 
uh, and how that will influence on our results on the ground. Size of units, uh, those hot months of the year, um, relatively small burn units compared to the March time frame. So even with the same number of burn operations, um, the total acres would be a lot less just because of the weather that time of year. Seasonality, kind of hit on that. It's big. If we're wanting to look at removing uh, woody species out of open land habitats, we're going to have to burn those hotter times of the year, that August, September time frame. If we're wanting cool season fires to consume uh, recent cedar slash or logging slash, we're going to have to burn in that December, January time frame. So it's a lot of things to consider. And then we have moisture patterns on any given year. Um, depending on what the moisture's been, can have a huge impact. And it may be dry this week, but if it rained um, six inches last week, the fuel moistures may be up. So there's a lot of things that play into account to whether we can actually burn or not. Weather is our most limiting factor. But just some key points to kind of wrap it up. We have to continue to educate. We came from a time to where it was hammered into the public that fire was bad. Fire's not good, you're burning up Bambi. That's shifted over time. There's been studies that have shown the public perception of prescribed fire has went from negative to being accepted. The education has to be among staff to continue to educate our staff and what the right type of fire looks like on the ground so that we're doing the right thing. And it has to be the landowners. Game and Fish uh, owns a small piece of land and even with other agencies, we still own a small piece, 90% of Arkansas is in, in public ownership. If we're going to make an effort on the ground at large scales, the landowners are going to have to be a part of that. Other forestry practices are, are key as well now. It's not something that fire can, can, can do anymore. As our forest grew up and that mesification took place, we entered high densities in Diameters of trees that fire just can't, we cannot reclaim it with fire alone. We have to do things like chemical injection. We have to do um, timber removal through harvest. All those things to get those sites back to where sunlight's on the ground. And then we can start putting the fire in there and hold those sites. Our weather is limited. We have to learn to expand the burn window. We have to learn to think outside of that typical time frame that January through March time frame. And, we, and we've done that, and other agencies are doing that. And we're gonna to have to continue to do that. We're gonna to continue to educate people what those fire effects are in those certain times of year, continue to expand those burn windows. We have to build our partnerships and maintain them. We have our state wildlife grants. We've done lots of good work with TNC, US Forest Service, other agencies, still state wildlife grants. We've done things with cooperative, um, documents to where we can help the Forest Service burn, they can help us burn, we can help TNC burn. We're all out there needing to do the same thing and burn. So we have to build those partnerships, we have to maintain them. We have to increase our numbers so we can get the, the fire on the ground. And the kind of last thing is multiple applications are necessary. We cannot just walk into a site and burn at one time and walk away. It has to be repeated burning. It has to be burning at the right time of the year, on the right day, at the right time with defined goals and defined objectives. We have to stay at it. Those applications are necessary. And with that, I'll kind of throw a picture up of one of my burn crew guys from the past and ask if anybody's got any questions. All right, thank you, Randy. Great presentation. Uh, who's got questions? Randy, one, one question uh, that I have, how, how do you determine the, the seasonality of a particular prescribed burn? Seasonality is gonna be uh, site specific. Um, going on the ground, looking at the site, looking at our fire history. So for all our sites, we document um, when we burned it, the year, the month. And as those sites get, kind of out of that restoration stage into the, the maintenance stage. Uh, the fuel loads get lighter, uh, get more grass dominated understories, those type of things where residual heat is an issue. We can start shifting those burns into the growing season. Our open lands, if we're getting a lot of woody encroachment, we would look at those 
maybe the sooner for uh, application in the growing season. It's just real site specific and, and you have to go out and look out on the ground. We know that historically Arkansas is drier in the fall and we know through studies that we would have been more likely to get lightning strikes, ignite dark burns from thunderstorms that time of year. So really, as we get these areas in that maintenance stage, we can start shifting them to their historical time frame, which would, which would better serve to meet that historical fire regime. What about, you know, you, you talked about the, the necessity of, you know, burning repeatedly over time and not just setting one fire and walking away and thinking everything's going to be great. How do you determine the, the fire return interval and, and is it the same across time or does that vary uh, as the site changes? So we have to be careful when we talk about fire return intervals. If we look at the maps, it says, well, this part of Arkansas burned every four years. We have to keep in, in mind that's an average. So it wouldn't stay the same across time. You might have two years in a row that that specific area might have burned historically, maybe two years in a row that we burn it. Um, and then it may be six for the next burn. To determine those intervals, it's it's really where we're at in the in the restoration stage. Um, on the front end, we're gonna burn more frequently to get the fuel loads down from whatever habitat practice we've done, if that's injection or a harvest or a mastication. And then we're going to step back and we're going to see what it wants to be and what it wants to do. We're going to look at what happens on the ground. Are we getting a good herbaceous response? Are we getting our grass response? Are we getting more woody response? And we're going to let that drive it. I've never been a fan of setting a return interval and saying, okay, we're going to burn this every two years. I want to look at it on a year to year basis with the area biologists, the area technicians, and and determine yeah this site needs burn or no it needs to set another year it's it's where we want it based on whatever the species we're managing for on that site thanks randy uh good stuff any, anybody else have any questions before we move on and uh talk with jimmy barnett about uh aquatic nuisance species specifically invasive carp okay randy thank you man great job thank you trey all right, uh, next up is Jimmy Barnett. He is our statewide invasive carp biologist. Jimmy has been with the agency for 34 years. I think that's right. Uh, yeah, 34 years. Uh, Jimmy started out as a, after getting his uh, degree in uh, fish and in biology with a concentration in fish and wildlife management from UALR. Uh, he started work with the agency in 1988, worked for a number of years as a fish culture technician and uh, then worked in the aquatic resources education program from 1996 to 2015 first as the assistant coordinator and later as the coordinator of that program and for the past six years was the uh, ans or aquatic nuisance species coordinator uh, jimmy take it away all right thanks Trey. We got you full screen there, Jimmy. Looks good. All right. First off, thank everybody for uh, tuning in today to, to learn about what all is going on in our agency. I'm here today to talk about an exciting new program uh, in our agency. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a need that, that we has been coming, and it's a need that we have currently. And uh, we're going to be working with invasive carp. Basically, there are uh, four species of uh, invasive carp in the state. Uh, the one that you hear the most common talked about is the silver carp. And then uh, the other one that is that it's his brother, kind of, is the big head carp. Both of these carp are planktivores, and they compete with our native fishes uh, in several arenas. Uh, number one, they grow very fast, so uh, just sheer biomass is one big competition they have. They are planktivores, so therefore they compete directly with uh, uh, paddlefish, uh, bigmouth buffalo, 
and also with uh, one of the bases for our food chain, and that's Shad. Uh, so that's that's the silver and the big head car. Uh, the other car, uh, one of the other evasive carp is grass car. They, the Arkansas Game and Fish used them for years as a biological control of aquatic vegetation. Uh, but in other other areas, they once they reach the wild waters of the of the United States, uh, they have become issues in other locations. And then the last species of invasive carp is black carp. And black carp eat mollusk. And in our state, we have somewhere about 14 species of, uh, of mussels that are on the threatened or endangered list. And black carp are, are a big detriment to our native carp population out here. So next thing I'd like to talk about is how did we get in this mess? Well, it all started way back in 1963 and uh, the fish lab at Stuttgart, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Fish Lab at Stuttgart imported some grass carp to be used as biological vegetation control animals. And then in 73, a uh, private producer imported silver, big heads, and black carp into the state. Those fish were transferred to the Game and Fish in 1974. Uh, the Game and Fish worked uh, with some people out of China and learned how to spawn the silvers and the big heads. They were brought in because, you know, it was thought that they're super filter feeders and it was thought that they could be used to break down nutrients in places that we have issues like sewer lagoons and sewer treatment ponds and things like that. And so it thought that they would really be a bene big benefit there. And it was at that time, back in that part of history, there was really no concern uh, for if they were to get in the wild. And uh, the black carp that were transferred from that first batch, they were held by the gaming fish until they all expired somewhere in late 78, 77 or early 78. Then the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service allowed importation of black carp in 93. They were brought back in and they were going to be used for a biological Control in catfish production ponds where they eat the snails and the snails are the cause for the yellow grubs that turn up in catfish flesh. Wouldn't know it jumps back and forth too many times on the year. So how did we get in this mess? Well, we just talked about that one. So let's see if my computer will work right this time. Okay, this program, what's neat about this program is, is this program comes to us at really no cost to the Arkansas Game and Fish at all. This is all done through uh, evasive carp grants that come out of the uh, Department of Interior. Appropriations are from Congress. When it originally started, it was kind of focused on the Great Lakes and the Illinois River. And it was done as they were hoping as a measure to protect the Great Lakes from invasion of these evasive carp. Then in 2015, the geographic scope was expanded and they added the Upper Miss and the Ohio River basins, which also includes the Tennessee Cumberland Basin. And then in 2020, uh, the scope was expanded again to include the entire Mississippi River Basin. And if you look at that map on this slide, all those colors are in the Mississippi River Basin, and there are six sub-basins in the Mississippi River Basin. So that's that's what the different colors are, the different sub-basins. And it's the Missouri sub-basin, the Arkansas Red-White sub-basin, the Lower Miss sub-basin, the Tennessee Cumberland sub-basin, the Ohio River sub-basin, and the Upper Mississippi River sub-basin. When funding first began, uh, back about 2015, it was only for $5.5 million a year. And then in 2020, that has climbed. And, and in 2020, it has made it up to $25 million a year. And there's specific language in the in the appropriations for Congress that that money can be used in all six of the sub bases. Arkansas is, is kind of a, a stepchild in this whole thing because we're one of the few states that is included in two sub basins about 50 50. 
There are several other states that have multiple sub-bases, but generally it's not just 50, about 50-50 of the state. So Arkansas is in both the lower Mississippi River sub-basin and the Arkansas Red-White sub-basin. Right now, under current funding, the lower Mississippi River sub-basin gets about $1.3 million a year, and the Arkansas Red-White gets about a million dollars a year. So as ANS coordinator, which is the job I had prior to the invasive carp biologist that I'm doing now, uh, this money became available. So I went right to work trying to get our get up, get Arkansas some of this money. And in FY 2020, uh, you can see on the screen there that we got uh, uh, about $863,000. And a lot of that money is going into research that is being done by Texas Tech, Auburn, and the uh, University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. And then I also had a little bit of money put in there. About $200,000 of that annual amount was for control of uh, and removal of invasive carp from our waters. And then in 2021, we asked for more control and invasive carp money. And uh, we have been approved for $300,000 in 2021. So as you see total there, we've got about $1.1 that is coming into the state for that, that we have in our hand right now that is being used to try to get a handle on these invasive carp and, and help us develop a long-term monitoring, management, and removal program. So really what my talk is really here to talk about today is, is I'm excited to talk about a new program that we have, and it is the Invasive Carp Removal Program. This program is being funded 100% by federal grant dollars. Uh, we, uh, we're, we're just excited to finally get it started. It's taken us almost a year to get uh, boots on the ground and work. The, what the grants that we have right now, uh, the areas, the Arkansas River, it covers from the Dardanelle Dam to the Mississippi and the White River covers from the Batesville Dam to the Mississippi. And this includes all backwaters, tributaries, and oxbows of both rivers. And the two maps that I have up there on the screen, you can see the, the part that is red, that's that's what part of, of those waters are in each of the grants that we have out there. So we, we got our grant money and our original plan was to hire commercial fishermen to remove these invasive carp from our waters, from the, those described detailed uh, waters. And uh, in September of 2020, I sent letters to every commercial fishing license holder, current commercial fishing license holder in the state, and told them of the, of the opportunity for this uh, funding, uh, for, the, for a job there, basically. And uh, 19 commercial fishermen contacted me and were really interested. And so they were sent an RFP and five of those 19 called me for about two weeks, almost every day. And then they said, yeah, we're all over this. We can't wait, you know, man, we want to do it. And, uh, and then on the submission date for their proposals, we didn't receive any proposals. So we went on to the next, the next plan and the next plan was to hire extra labor employees. And uh, basically I'm trying to hire five extra labor employees. I want two crews of two and then have one person that can work back and forth between boats. Like I could have used that person today because I had somebody call in sick. So it would have been nice to have an extra person available today to fill in. Currently we have two guys working and, uh, and after this presentation today, I'm going to the Little Rock office to turn in paperwork to hire two more. And I hope tomorrow to turn in the paperwork to hire the fifth one to get us up to, to full staff. But we had to do a little bit of rearranging to the, the grants. Uh, the original grants were all out there. It was contractual dollars that we could ask for. And so we had the grants amended and the grants now allow us to pay uh, employees and they allow us to buy boats and sampling gear and then uh, we went to work with uh, trying to figure out a, a home base for, for this program. And uh, we approached Wildlife Management Division uh, and asked them what about 
could we share some space in the Wattensaw uh, Wildlife Missionary Headquarters? And they were all for it, uh, 100%. We appreciate them for jumping on there. Uh, Wattensaw just happens to be, if you really get a map and you put a dot on it, it's about centrally located in that scope, that geographic scope that I described earlier. So, you know, it's about halfway between uh, on the White River to, from Wattensaw to Batesville and from Wattensaw to Tishner. That's about halfway. On the Arkansas, it's a hair further to part of it, but on some of it, it still is very centrally located and a, and a good area for it to work from. So a, a big thank you to the Wildlife Management Division for working with us on that. So why are we doing this? Well, a, the invasive car funding has to be used for implementation of the National Invasive Car Management Plan, which was approved by the ANS Task Force. And specifically, when you get into goal three, it talks about we want to extirpate or reduce levels of significant effect, feral populations of big head, black grass, and silver carp in the United States. Strategy four under that is physical removal by natural resource management agencies. Well, if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure the Game and Fish is a natural resource management agency. So, so we fit right in with using these funds for removal of carp. Goals of the program are listed here. We want to reduce the, the numbers of invasive carp, and then we hope that will help limit range expansion. These things are expanding uh, rapidly now that their, their population and densities are up. They're expanding up our streams, and, and we would like to slow that expansion down if at all possible. We want to reduce the invasion pressure and competition on our native species. Uh, the crappie fishermen up down the White River have been complaining to me for years that since the, the silver carp have got so thick that they're just not catching the, the, the crappie anymore. Uh, we're also going to be collecting biological data so that it will help increase our knowledge and understanding of the abundance, demographics, reproduction capabilities, and, and provide, you know, that provides us information for future management decisions. Uh, we're also going to collect data from the, the two crews that we're going to have out there since even all the way back when Mark Oliver was still the chief of fisheries, uh, we were have been approached by many investors wanting to set up a processing plant here in the state. And uh, uh, the, the first question they always ask is, well, how many are we going to get? What can we expect? We don't have to, we didn't know. We, so this, this collection data that our, true, our two crews will be collecting is we'll be able to say, hey, I've got two crews and they're collecting this. So if you get a processing facility here and you make it worthwhile to commercial fishermen, you can expect a whole lot more fish. Uh, one of the one of my big goals in this program is is I want our removal efforts to have minimal impact on the native species. So uh, we're, we're, we're trying everything in our power not to catch other fish. We're trying to focus on invasive carp, and also by reducing numbers, it's going to protect uh, our recreational users out there. I had some people telling me just just yesterday that they generally hang out at Maddox Bay and, and tune their kids around all, but there's got to be so many carp down there right now that they're they're afraid to get their kids out there. So basically, our guys, we got our two guys hired. And uh, they started uh, the uh, second week in October. And here's the results of what we've done through eight weeks. Uh, it was a big learning curve. We had to learn about a lot about uh, putting nets out and pulling nets in and taking fish out of nets and how to how to focus on the basic carp and whatnot. And uh, so you can see here our total so far, we've caught 693 fish, uh, a little over 8,700 pounds. And so the next logical question that a lot of people ask, well, what are we doing with all these carp? Well, right now we're, we're just doing the best we can to dispose them in a responsible manner. But our goals are we're, we're working, trying to get something set up where we can have some of the fish process to go to like the hunters feeding the hungry so they'll reach reach out to the needy families. If we can recruit a processing plant in, there's really three ways to utilize these fish 
out there in the world. You can make fertilizer out of them. You can make pet food out of them. And you, uh, there is a market out there now for human consumption. So we're, we don't want to waste the fish. We want the fish to go to use, but we also want to reduce the numbers out there. So some lessons we've learned so far is first thing we did, and it didn't take but about three days to, for me to figure this one out, is active sets catch more evasive carp than passive sets. Uh, we, we, we originally started, we set nets one morning, ran them that afternoon, left them overnight, ran them the next morning and moved them. First thing I discovered right off the bat is, is those nets that you leave out overnight, your, your bycatch or incidental catch of other species goes up, your catch of evasive carp goes down. So we learned that it's just a whole lot better just to, to find the fish, drop your nets on them, uh, stir the water up real good as we call it, and uh, pick your nets up and pick your carp out and move on to the next location. Another thing I learned, and I, I got this tip from my counterpart in Kentucky, is your nets need to reach from the bottom to the surface. If you have your, if your net, if your float line is not to the surface, they go right over the top. If you float your net and your lead line doesn't go to the bottom, they go under your net. We have already learned, man, these, these evasive carp are geniuses at avoiding nets. You can slip in real quiet, put a net out, not make any noise at all, and then just back off and watch, and they immediately start doing things to evade the nets. They'll jump, they'll run, they, they just want to get away from the nets. So you have to set lots of uh, side-by-side -side nets. You set nets in zigzags, so if they jump one wall, they jump into another wall. Uh, they're pretty slick. So uh, so we want to, we're, we're trying to learn our best way that we can make the best use of our time out on the water. And with that, I'll take any questions. I do want to leave a note down here that you can go to Evasive Carp US, the, uh, the national uh, carp management plan is there. That was done by, it's listed as Conover in 2007. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Yeah, Jimmy, it looks like uh, Blake Sassy may have a question. Blake? Hey, hey, Jimmy, what metric are you going to be using to see how well you are making a difference in lowering their populations over time? Well, if I can get this computer to stop sharing, maybe I've maybe I made it now. You're All good, right. Jimmy. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, like what we're what we're going the metric we're going to be using right now is, and, and again, this is that we're having to learn and adapt as we go because this is all brand new stuff. But right now, what we've got up our sleeve, and matter of fact, they're doing it today, is some of the waters that we we have gone in and called and removed carp. We're giving it about 30 days and we're going in and sampling it again and see, are we having an effect? Are our catch rates going down? Is the water recharging from, from, you know, if it's hooked to one of the rivers, is it recharging for fish out of the river? Uh, that basically, Blake, when you boil it down to it, catch rates is going to be the biggest thing that we can do to look at to see if we're really having an effect on the fish out there. All right, uh, uh, Chris Madal has a question in the comments section. With so much area to cover, how do you select sites and decide where to set nets, Jimmy? That's a great question. Uh, we are running right now just on knowledge that I have gained from, I have been working with Silver Carp for about the last four years in the White and the Arkansas River. I have done a lot of collections and a lot of samples. And so for right now, we're running off of, of my institutional knowledge of, of just being out there on the grounds and seeing the car. Uh, but my goal is if I can ever get full staffed and get the chance, part of my job as, as a basic car biologist is I want to get out and start visiting one-on-one -on -one with the commercial fishermen and pick the, you know, pick their brains about uh, places they see high densities of car. Uh, you know, I want to get reports back from our uh, district biologists that work in certain waters and where they get uh, comments from the public that, hey, such and such body of water over here is just covered up with silver carp. So that's kind of how we're doing. But I do have, we are tracking all of, 
every net is recorded by GPS coordinates. And one of the long-term goals after uh, probably a year or more of, of collecting carp is I want to eventually be able to produce a heat map. So in other words, we can look at the White River and where it's red, it's high densities, and where it's, it's uh, white, there's low densities. So in other words, we can kind of look at those densities and that'll kind of guide our removal locations and efforts and spots too. Jimmy, I got a quick question. You, you alluded to, uh, you know, talking to your uh, counterpart in, in Kentucky and the issues on, on Kentucky and Barkley Lakes have been well publicized, even in, uh, e even in mainstream media. Uh, you also talked a little bit about, you know, the, the expansion of funding uh, over the past decade or so. What are other states doing? Uh, who, who, what all other states, especially, you know, maybe neighboring states, do others have these invasive carp removal teams or, or are we one of the few? What's everybody else doing in this regard? We're, we're kind of breaking ground on this, Trey. Uh, what's going on in Kentucky is, is they actually have dedicated employees for removal. But one reason you can do it, it's so easy to do that in Kentucky this time here, is they have several processing facilities. So they have a place to put these fish as they're caught. Uh, they, they are doing like I said, some agency removal, but they also have a big program with the commercial fishermen that is doing a subsidy. You can't do a subsidy if you don't have somewhere for the commercial fishermen to sell the fish to start with. So Illinois has a, has a big program, and they also have processing plants where that uh, uh, they can you pay a subsidy and get the commercial fishermen to work up there. But nowhere in the lower miss is there really anybody else doing this. And when I, I serve on several regional committees uh, that I'm on, one, of, one is for each of these basins, I'm on that committee, so is all the other ANS coordinators and, and invasive park people for that state are on that committee. And and when we have meetings now, they wear me out picking my brain because they're wanting to know, hey, how's it going? What are you doing next? You know, they're wanting to know, how do we get this started in our state? We're watching you to see what's going on. Okay, Jimmy, my, my last question, unless anybody else uh, uh, wants to jump in, uh, you're talking about the commercial facility. Do, do you think that, you know, some of this work and, and being able, as you mentioned, you talked about Mark Oliver, people coming to us as far back as then and saying, you know, we, we, we'd like to invest in a, in a, a commercial production facility to, to, to process these things. And we couldn't really tell them. All right. Number one is this work hopefully going to, to, to maybe, be able to give some of that information uh, to those folks and two, what are the realistic possibilities of, of, of maybe getting a commercial facility established and, and are there any pitfalls that come with that? You know, really Trey, there, there's not any pitfalls. I am involved in the Mississippi River Basin Panel on a and and have been uh, for the last six years. And one of the projects of that group was is we actually set up a, a document of standards, a white paper per se, as that removal means removal. It does not mean sustained removal. In other words, we're wanting to, you're wanting to reduce populations. You're not wanting these things to be able to keep producing. Uh, you talk about likely locations. I know that about seven years ago that there was an investment group that actually bought a building in Augusta with full intentions of setting it up and then they kind of fell out of it. Uh, but we have several abandoned, and I say abandoned, closed down uh, catfish processing plants in the southeast part of the state to where if an investment group wanted to come in, hey, the, the, the basics are there. It just takes a little bit of retrofitting to get it up for a process to make some car. So basically it's got needs to be somewhere in East Arkansas you know, I hadn't even mentioned today the other rivers out there. The St. Francis has a tremendous population of, 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 of basic carp. Uh, the Cache River has a pretty big population of basic carp. Several of the bigger tributaries, uh, like Biomeda, uh, Big Creek, several of those have lots of basic carp. In it. So it's basically centered in eastern Arkansas with the, I'd say probably the heaviest part of it is the southeast quarter of the state. I said last question, but I got one more. 
So, because you touched on it in that answer, but I mean, I know the goal is removal. We'd like to completely eradicate these things, but realistically, what does winning this battle against invasive carp look like? Trey, that's that's real hard to answer, isn't it? And the reason is, and some of this research that we're having done, some of these other dollars from this grant that is going to research and all, number one, we don't have any documented proof that any of these carp are reproducing in Arkansas waters, okay? But we do have several uh, documented cases of big spawns happening in the Mississippi and those fish as small fish, I'm talking about a little five to six inches, making mass migrations up our rivers. So how do you win this? Well, you win this if you can get that spawning potential reduced is where you get hit. It does work in the Ohio River. They have actually reduced numbers, and I can't tell you the, the names of the locks and dams, but originally they have actually dropped the population down to basically nothing in the upper two pools that had quite a few fish in them. So you've got to start somewhere. You know, the old story I always like to say, they ask, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So we've got to start somewhere. And in my mind, every fish I take out, that's one less fish that's out there. It's one less chance for one to be able to spawn if they ever can spawn in Arkansas. We got to start somewhere. All right. Thank you, Jimmy. In, any other questions before we wrap it up? Okay. Uh, Jimmy and Randy, both uh, great job. Uh, wonderful presentations. Very informative about a couple of topics that I think a lot of folks can uh, really relate to, uh, both of which have. Uh, uh, gotten a considerable amount of media attention, uh, really even beyond our, our, our usual audience and uh, constituency. Uh, thank you so much, and thank everybody for uh, tuning in today, and we'll see you in January for the next uh, iteration of the Wild Science Webinar. Thanks, everybody.